the first uh, principle we're going to look at, the first lesson is in ministry you will regularly receive criticism. Uh, it's a pretty uh, good one to start with. You see, no ministry, on, uh, no ministry leader on the face of the planet has avoided criticism in their ministry. One sermon that you preached can lead someone to Christ and they experience the greatest moment in their life. On the other hand, the same sermon will bring criticism that you wore a certain dress shirt that a certain person didn't like. But one person gets saved in the very same service and the other person looks at you and your shirt is not the right color. A church disciplinary decision can bring up extreme criticism. Without any knowledge of the details, there will be some who question your leadership and assume many things that are not true. The leader is left without much ammo because the matter is private. You can't vindicate yourself as a leader because you have as authority as a pastor to conceal the matter, what was done in private. The Apostle Paul experienced intense criticism in his ministry. In Acts 13, 14, it is one of the longest sermons preached by Paul, who was one of the greatest preachers of the early church. Here, Paul and his ministry partners arrived in uh, Antioch, and they went to a synagogue on Sabbath. If we look at verse 16, Paul was asked if he had anything to say during the service. And we read in Acts 13, 16, he says this. Then Paul stood up, beckoning with his hands, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. You see, Paul goes on to, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in the synagogue and through the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, this, there is forgiveness of sins. The apostle does not hold back in fear what will be the result of his sermon. I think Paul understood that when he was preaching Jesus in a synagogue, it might have some criticism after. You see, through this one sermon, there were those who were affected by what Paul said and that they could not wait until the next Sabbath. If you look at the context and the, and the verses that follow, some couldn't wait to be with Paul to hear the next sermon on the next Sabbath. And apparently some of them professed to believe in Jesus. While there were others who rejected the message, in verse 45, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul. Paul preached, what well, Paul preached, nothing in his message was wrong. He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, it brought division and criticism. But the most important part, there was also a positive response. Acts 13, 48, in our passage, it says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Amen. The same message brought people life in meeting Jesus Christ, and the other message brought complete, same message brought complete division, rejection. As Pastor Beto has told me, I've never forgot, when I was in uh, high school, he, he said this, he said, David, the gospel demands a response. And, the, and that is so true. Every time the gospel demands a response, every time the gospel is preached, it always demands a response. Either someone will reject it vehemently, or they'll come humbly, broken, to accept salvation from a God who only wants the best for his people. You see, there should be two responses in criticism, uh, John and Eric, that I've learned in ministry. Number one, filter through criticism. Number two, use discernment in your response. You see, when we filter through criticism, not all criticism should be treated the same. It shouldn't, shouldn't be treated the same. Most of the criticism that I've received personally the last seven years were absolutely useless, and some even ridiculous, completely absent from the truth. Although there were criticisms that were helpful and needed. Pastors are not perfect, and there will be times where we make mistakes, and some criticisms are justified. But as pastors, we cannot place all criticism on the same level and label them as useless or not profitable. Paul rebuked Peter in Galatians 2.11, but when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. Peter received criticism and was truly doing something wrong. We have to filter and ask the Lord to give us clarity to see. Use discernment in your response. Romans 12, 18, I, I often quote this verse in my head. If it be possible, as much as life in you, 
Live peaceably with men. Live peaceably with men. I've prayed over and asked the Lord to work on me in this area. How do I respond to my critics? To be honest, most criticism does not demand a response. When I'm confronted by useless critics, critiques, I try to act in a loving manner and not, not be defensive. I constantly have Romans 12, 18 in my mind. I must admit, some criticism does, does get me upset and occupies my mind. But I'm always reminded about the response Paul and Barnabas had when they were getting persecuted for preaching Jesus Christ. Acts 13, 51 through 52, same chapter. It says, but they shook off the dust of their feet against them, and they came unto Iconium. And verse 22 says, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. See, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas didn't take it personally. They didn't take the criticism personally for serving Jesus Christ. They didn't cry about it. They didn't not gossip to others about hateful ways that they were treated. Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas they, they shook off the dust off their feet. They shook off the dust. And they shook it off the criticism, and they rejoiced alongside the disciples. When you face criticism in a ministry, and most of all it will be useless, shake off the dust and rejoice. Because you are being used by Jesus Christ, and you have been given a divine mission. Now I want to address the congregation. Many of you are from one particular community, and I, since I have the ability and time right now to preach, I'm going to speak to you for a minute. You see, I believe I have a unique perspective into our community. And serving in several different communities and cultures, I want to talk to our congregation. I want to address our community just for a second. In our community, we give honor and respect and hold high regard to preachers that are distant from us, right? If a, if a preacher is separated from us, we don't go to their church, we hold them in high regard. Meaning those who do not, we don't fall under submission in our local church. And the pastor and leaders that we do fall under authority, we often criticize, we often oppose. We don't oppose that preacher that is 20, 2,500 miles away on the other coast. We oppose those who were under. And I found a strong opposition towards leadership in our community, specifically in our community. And you know what I'm talking about. In churches. Why? Why are you... Why do you have an opposition in the church? Why are members of the church so critical of our own people? Do you think God is impressed with your opposition and your critique? Do you think establishing an opposition within a church is what God wants you to do? I can give you the answer to that. No. Mark 3.25 says this, If a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. These are the words of Jesus found in the Gospel of Mark, and the church can only thrive in unity. Did you hear that, church? Unity together. Today I'm calling for the unity of the Church of Rochester. Those who visit as well, unity. Psalm 133.1, I love this verse. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. There's no uh, rejoicing when there's strife and division, but there's, there's, there's pleasantness. There's, it, it's pleasant to be with brethren and men and women who agree, who are unified. It is time for us to lay down our weapons that we're using to fight one another and fight leadership in the churches you attend. It is time for unity. And I'd like to ask you a question. Do you pray for the, churches, for the church you go to? I know not everybody calls the Church of Rochester your home. Do you pray regularly for the pastor of the church that you attend? I know you criticize him, but do you pray for him? Do you pray for the pastor of the home church that you're at? Do you pray for their spouse? Do you pray for the kids? Do you pray for, for their family or extended family? Or do you regularly keep him on your mind? Do you pray for their spiritual well-being? Do you daily pray for their physical well-being? Whatever church you call your home, there must be a unity found in prayer of the saints in the congregation. And church, I encourage you all to pray for those who God has placed as leaders over you in the church. It doesn't mean that the leader is smarter than you. It doesn't mean that the, the leader is more spiritual than you. It's, it's because God placed that leader in that church over you, and whether you are, are, are smarter or spiritual or more spiritual, you have to be in submission to that person. 
Because God placed them there. God hand chose these men to be in the ministry of the Church of Rochester. And our goal as people who fall under this is to support them in our prayers. Amen? And whatever church you're a part of, you, the list of pastors should be on a list where you're praying for them daily. Because you call that your home. Amen. And we need to be more unified.